I just can't go over it. How has it affected the family? It's affected every one of them. Would you have any kind of warning to the parents of youngsters, particularly here in Scotland, who were thinking in terms of going down to London? Never to go. It's such a cruel, horrible place. The London train pulls out from Edinburgh's Waverley station. Apart from businessmen and holidaymakers, it often carries teenagers, some of them stowaways, fleeing from the deprivation and hopelessness endemic in many of Scotland's sprawling housing estates. These were the victims of Dennis Nielsen, drifters who'd strayed to London in the expectation of streets paved with gold and beacon lights that would guide them to prosperity. People like Billy Sutherland, who was killed by Nielsen after a massive drinking session. Billy Sutherland lived on an estate in Edinburgh where he was unable to get a job. Even the graffiti here seems to spring from a deep well of bitterness and frustration. When they first brought up on Youth at 10, when we saw the ground, and I, I didn't really think about it much because I didn't think Billy could be one of the victims. He knew how to handle himself and take care of himself. Um, and it wasn't until I learned that Billy was one of the victims and it hit me that all these policemen were walking all over his body and all over the other victims' bodies that were buried in the garden. I mean, I, I loved the guy, I married him. Another victim was Steve Sinclair, the product of a shattered childhood. He was slow at learning to speak and walk. His life was to become a constant carousel of institutions. Mental hospital, special school, eventually Borstal and then prison. He was wild, yeah, because when he went to dances, he used to fight with his mates coming home, you know. Always the fists up, always on the defensive, all the time. Bob Blythe is a social worker who knew Steve Sinclair. I suppose that Steve fell into um, the group of, of youngsters that had certain problems that uh, he couldn't cope with and, and felt that perhaps by coming to London he could have a new opportunity to resolve those difficulties. Why then was it a bad idea for him to come to London? I mean, what sort of problems did he face when he came? Well, I think like most of the youngsters that come to London, the first thing that they find is, is that London isn't what it appears to be on television, which are the bright lights of Piccadilly. Um, but really, uh, London is a very sad place. Nielsen's victims were largely drawn from that group of rootless youngsters who now inhabit the shadowy world of London's West End a world of night shelters and lodging units, a world of drug abuse and emotional problems, triggered by a deep feeling of frustration born out of the knowledge that they are the forgotten generation, a generation upon which Dennis Nielsen preyed. Dennis Andrew Nielsen was born on the 23rd of November 1945 in Fraserburgh, Scotland. He spent the early years of his life in this house. According to his mother, he was a quiet boy. Little, if anything, marked him out from the ordinary. Nielsen went to school in Fraserburgh, but during his school days he never knew his father, who walked out on the family while Dennis was still very young. At the time of his arrest, Dennis Nielsen hadn't seen his mother for ten years. How do you think Dennis was able to become involved in this kind of problem and then be able to live from day to day? No, well, that's the bit I don't understand. I just don't understand how this could go on and nobody knowing anything. I mean, I don't know any but these 10 years of his life and I can't see what was happening to him. Something must have happened to him because it's not my Dennis that's doing it. Not the boy I knew that's doing these things. At the age of 15, Nielsen decided to join the army. He signed up in Aberdeen, transferred to Aldershot, and after a three-year training period with the Army Catering Corps, including a course in butchery, Dennis Nielsen spent the best part of a decade travelling the world. He went to West Germany with the City of London Regiment. 
he transferred to the king's own Scottish borderers, cooking for the men who guarded the Almonsura prison in Aden. After that, Nielsen was off to the Gulf. He volunteered for the Trucial Oman Scouts, an Arab regiment led by British officers. Then he was on the move again, this time with the Argyle and Sutherland Highlanders to Cyprus. He stayed with the Argyles when they moved on to Ballater near Balmoral in Scotland, where Nielsen cooked for the Queen's Guard here at the Victoria Barracks. He was rated a good soldier and even won the General Service Medal. But after serving in Northern Ireland, he decided to leave the army. Dennis Nielsen then joined the Metropolitan Police Force, but his new career lasted for just 11 months. After a short spell as a security guard, he became a civil servant working for the Manpower Services Commission in several job centres around London. He lived at 195 Melrose Avenue in a ground floor flat with access to the land behind. He later moved to this house in Cranley Gardens. A lonely man who spent many solitary hours gazing at Karl Marx's grave and who bored his workmates with interminable chatter, Dennis Nielsen craved company. He found it in the pubs of North London, the Black Cap by Camden Town Tube Station, the Golden Lion in the heart of Soho, the Salisbury in the West End. It was in these pubs that Nielsen met his victims. Carl Stotter met Nielsen at the Black Cap, where he agreed to go back to Nielsen's flat. I fell asleep and I woke up and he was strangling me. And um, I passed out um, after sort of thinking, I, I actually I thought that I'd got caught up in the sleeping bag which he'd warned me about. And I thought he was helping me out, but he wasn't. And I, anyway, I passed out from that and I remember vaguely hearing water running and being carried and I felt very cold and I realised I was in the bath and he was trying to drown me. Dennis Nielsen spared Carl Stotter, but at least 15 people weren't so lucky. They paid the ultimate price for Dennis Nielsen's hospitality. He killed them, he chopped up their bodies and he then burned, boiled or buried the pieces. But Nielsen's reign of carnage was coming to an end. In February of this year, a diner rod man discovered some human remains in a manhole near Nielsen's last home in North London. Nielsen was arrested and a search of Melrose Avenue and Cranley Gardens revealed more than a thousand pieces of flesh and bone. A special unit was set up at Hornsey Police Station to try and identify the dead people. Scotland Yard's Missing Persons Bureau, B14, was called in to help. In the end, fewer than half of Dennis Nielsen's victims were identified. Even Nielsen himself doesn't know who the others were. The question the jurors had to ask themselves at Dennis Nielsen's trial was this. Could Nielsen possibly be responsible for his own actions? John Listeners has been studying the man for the past nine months. He's written a book on the Nielsen affair, which is being serialised in the news of the world. The Crown said that he was in command of the situation, that he knew what he was doing all the time. The defence said that he did not know what he was doing when he committed the acts of murder. But what sort of a man do you think Dennis Nielsen is? I think Nielsen was a man who stalked victims by night in a patch he knew very well, areas that he'd been to as a policeman, as a night guard. He loved the sordid, seamy life. He used to observe it. He's a voyeur of the uh, underworld, if you like. And I think over the years, he um, grew so much a part of it that he wanted something more. His office life, I think, was very boring. He was a very strong union man, but he wanted an excitement which he never found in the civil service. Dennis Nielsen was incarcerated in his own personality. His mother says that when he was finally arrested, he walked out of one prison into another. But does she still think of Dennis as her son? Yes, he's always my son. And that's why I want him to know that we're all concerned about him. And I just hope he'll get some help to cope with the situation he's in. Life took Dennis Nielsen from a childhood in the spacious countryside of northeast Scotland to the dark, dingy streets of London's West End, 
where he found so many unfortunate youngsters. As Nielsen wrote later, I decided to release them from the slings and arrows of their outrageous fortune.